Hello and welcome to the presentation, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for part three of Hitwise's three-part series on mastering digital marketing tactics. Uh, today's presentation um, and part three of this series is, all, is focused on knowing buyers versus browsers. I actually like to introduce your speakers for today. Um, first, joining us is uh, John Fetto, um, who is a Hitwise senior analyst. And joining John is Chris Curtis, also known as CPC, who serves as our VP of Client Development. Um, now I'd like to hand it over to CPC to kick us off. All right. Thanks so much, Lisa. In, in terms of the agenda for today, um, we're going to have just a quick intro to Hitwise and then really get into the meat of what it means to how we can identify buyers versus browsers and discuss some of the common challenges and use cases we see around that. And then we'll wrap up at the end with some, with some key takeaways. Um, for those of you who um, aren't familiar with Hitwise, um, I just want to offer a, a, a brief overview here. So Hitwise is an insights company, and for nearly 20 years, we've been in the competitive intelligence and the audience insights space. Um, you know, the, the backbone, really the backbone of our, of our platform and our intelligence is our data. And to characterize that data, we have a digital panel of about 8 million U.S. consumers and what we see on that digital panel on a monthly basis is over 20 million websites and over a half billion keywords. So um, basically whatever we see going through their, their, their browser from a search or URL standpoint, we're capturing that and able to report on that. And also we've got about close to a 50-50 split on desktop versus mobile devices that composes our panel, which is super important. And I'd say if there's a few elements that really characterize our data, it really is scale and depth and the persistence of that data. And scale and depth are, are super important when it gets to the, to the theme of this, um, this webinar and understanding buyers. Um, you know, quickly, in terms of use cases, there's really two buckets of use cases. Um, competitive intelligence is a significant um, reason why uh, clients work with us, uh, whether it's for benchmarking, SEM, SEO keyword analysis, understanding upstream downstream traffic, or the conversion funnel of yourself or your competitor. There's a lot that we can help expose about the competitive set across a lot of key metrics and, and, and health checks on the business. And on the audience insight side, um, some of the most popular things that our clients do are they, they define and analyze key personas using search terms and websites and demographics to create personas and then understand their, their demographics, um, their search behavior, how they navigate the internet. Um, there's a lot of creative development and understanding key motivations of, of consumers, again, using website and search, how does that, in, how does that help influence what um, creative should be shown? But again, audience insights and competitive intelligence are really the, the major buckets of use cases. And maybe to bring this, um, bring Hitwise a little bit closer to the, the topic of the webinar, I want to highlight just here why scale and depth are so important. If you think of the, you know, the consumer journey, to really be able to see and provide insights across that whole path, including the purchase, you have to have scale and you have to have depth. And from a scale standpoint, you need to have enough of a, of a, of a digital panel to, to represent the online population and have coverage across all the different types of consumers and geographics and whatnot. And then from a depth perspective, if you cannot go super deep on those consumers, you're really not going to see those smaller occurrences. So, you know, for every 100 people to visit a site, if only two to five are, you know, making a transaction or a purchase, if you don't have depth, you're really not going to see those key data points. And I think that's really what I want to hit home on here is if you look at you know, maybe a representation of Hitwise data on the bottom versus data available from some other competitors in the market, because we have so much scale and depth, we do see a lot of those purchase points and transactions across our, our panel. And that really is the heart of, um, of what this webinar is about. Because we see all their browsing data and we see their transaction or their purchase data, we really can get into that, the difference between buyers and browsers, um, which is, again, the, that's, that's the core topic of our, of our webinar today. So John's going to help explain a little bit about, like, how do we identify those? And then we'll get going with some, some use cases here. Yeah, thanks, CPC. Um, so in terms of identifying the the buyer specifically, uh, we can, you know, Hitwise takes all of the data that um, that we deliver through our syndicated platforms and we roll it up generally to the the top uh, domains. So here's an example here. If you're visiting CreightonBarrel.com, we're taking all of the um, active, all the pages um, under CreightonBarrel.com and aggregating it up 
into uh, the, the, the main core domain. Um, we also, as we covered on part two of the webinar series a few weeks ago, we do also have the ability to break out like purchase pages or our product pages rather. So here's an example of what a product page URL might look like and Hitwise is following, uh, is identifying those, those product page uh, patterns and saying here is, uh, here's a list of all of the product pages um, on a URL. Now, when it comes to uh, identifying the buyers, usually, and for the most part, when people make a purchase on a page, you arrive at the end of your purchase on a purchase confirmation page. It'll say the thank you page um, for making a purchase. And those also um, follow usually very specific patterns. And in this case, it's crateandbarrel.com slash checkout slash confirmation uh, are the mo main elements that Hitwise is, is pulling out of that domain. And I'm saying that, you know, when a person in our panel visits this domain, it's because they have made a purchase on Crate and Barrel, and we can set those up across a number of different retail, travel, finance, um, you name it. You can set up those across a number of different sites, uh, regardless, because most industries follow the same type of, of transaction or, or purchase page uh, pattern. Cool. John, that's, that's, that's helpful from, I guess, uh, understanding that concept. Um, yeah, in terms of some of the questions that we get from our clients, and we work with clients across all verticals in multiple countries, uh, so we you know, have a pretty good pulse of, of what the demands are when it comes to understanding where can understanding transactions and a buyer experience make a difference. But we hear a lot from clients, how can Hitwise go a level deeper to provide insights into transactions? Obviously, benchmarking and, and market share matters from a visit standpoint, but um, obviously sales are, are, are what we're all after and the clients are after. Um, we are often like, what are additional metrics that Hitwise can offer to monitor the health and progress of our business? Uh, John will be teasing out some of those with some of our examples. Um, we, we absolutely hear from clients, how can I get more teams into Hitwise? Um, you know, we may be working very closely with the search or the analytics teams, but they have other groups within their organizations that they want to understand the use cases so they can drive additional ROI out of the platform. And then lastly, we, we, by marketers in particular, we are constantly challenged, how can I use your data to drive more sales or incremental revenue? So these are some of the high-level questions that as we, as we go through, and John takes us through various use cases across a few industries here, these are the types of things that our, that our data, when it comes to understanding browsers versus buyers, I think can help, um, can help answer. Yeah, so we've pulled together quite a few different examples here. We kind of take a high-level view, and then we also look at the behaviors that we can glean from some of those buyer um, metrics that we are able to deliver. So this one starts out with a very um, high-level hit-wise view where we're looking at, you know, visits to uh, two competitors in the, in the home hardware space. We looked at Home Depot and we looked at Lowe's. And we can see between the two kind of leaders in the category that Home Depot generally has about 60% of the visits um, and Home Depot, I'm sorry, and Lowe's has about 40% of the visits. And we're looking at that over about three, um, four week periods here. So we can see that's fairly consistent. You know, all Home Depot is consistently uh, taking about 60% of the visit share of the market. And if you're uh, and if you're Lowe's or if you're another uh, person monitoring the space, you may equate, um, you may think that Home Depot actually has about 60% of the business as well. And that's, uh, and that's something that we can show um, is actually not the case because when we look at the percentage of people who are making purchases on Home Depot, again, arriving at those thank you confirmation pages on either Home Depot or Lowe's, Home Depot actually has a much larger share. They've gone up to 70% of the purchases between those two sites. And, and Lowe's has dropped down to to 30%. And you know, and furthermore, I know that we were looking at this, and it, it's probably not very evident uh, because it's it's a very a fairly slow uh, growth. But between the first month, which we started over here in July, and the and the last uh, month period ending in October, Home Depot has actually gained about a point per month moving forward. So, um, you know, they're Lowe's is actually moving in the wrong direction. They're actually losing share, and Home Depot is, is gobbling up a little bit more each month as, as, as kind of time goes on. So this is a way to really see, you know, what percentage of the actual business and, and purchases, because at the end of the day, that's really uh, generally what matters most, um, what people are trying to get at, um, but also a way to kind of track that from a competitive standpoint over time to see, you know, how are you performing? How, what's, how am I doing relative to my competition here? Um, 
we can also, you know, knowing the information for knowing the purchase information, we can apply all the other standard HIPWISE metrics to it. So we allow our customers to break out the data across devices and we can look at the conversion rates um, across desktop and mobile devices for both of the sites. And so we can see, you know, obviously uh, Home Depot's conversion rate overall is, is, is much better. It's at about 1.1% or so versus uh, Lowe's, which has about 0.6%. So, you know, Home Depot's conversion rate is about, you know, 50% better uh, than Lowe's. But then we look at the desktop uh, performance here and, and, and Home Depot is, is even better um, on desktop, whereas on mobile, both sites, you know, do, do struggle a little bit, but that's normal for, you know, mobile devices don't, don't generally uh, convert at the same rate, so we can at least compare them to their competitors. And this is why probably uh, Home Depot is doing so much better in terms of the transactions because their, com their device, uh, their con conversion rates across devices um, are so much better. Yeah, Sean, I think it's you know, obviously the, the reason we see the delta in the visits versus the conversions is absolutely the conversion rate. You know, ha having worked in e-commerce for, for over 10 years, yeah, there's a lot of things that could drive that. You think of site design or even your, your site load speed. You know, there could be fundamental differences between those. Um, category mix could be, you know, a big different reason. So as I look at, you know, Lowe's may look at it and say, like, wow, I'm way behind. I think the logical question would be, like, why? Um, maybe it's that Home Depot's figured out how to better produce search results and, and leverage personalization. Um, they may have different, like, online to, to in-store pickup strategies which you know, I think a lot of clicks to bricks are becoming more popular. And so there, there's a lot of different things that are out there. And I, maybe I think you're probably going to highlight a few of those. But I would say Lowe's would probably be looking at saying, why? Like, why is that conversion rate so different? Yeah, and, and this is, as you just mentioned, you know, what, what else might they be doing? So another way we can, we can kind of dig into that is, is looking at, you know, the conversion rates um against against dmas or it could be against the specific demographic um or other types of audiences but here i know that you uh, looked at this um in the lead up to today's presentation and ran the conversion rate uh relative for, for each of the, the 210 dmas and there was really there were definitely some really interesting stories to tell here i mean this, these are indexing the conversion rate for each site relative to their overall conversion rates this isn't necessarily saying that Home Depot is performing 37% better than Lowe's in New York. It's actually Home Depot is performing 37% better than their overall nationwide average in New York. And the data actually showed you know, a pretty interesting um, pattern where Home Depot is really um, is really killing it in large kind of urban DMAs, primarily on the East Coast, but like New York, uh, Chicago, Boston. Um, lots of the lots of the big cities on the East Coast, they're really their conversion rates are are much higher than they're than they're doing in other parts of the United States. Chicago, interestingly, for both for both uh, retailers, had fairly low conversion rates. Um, but you can definitely see, you know, maybe where for if you're low, is trying to identify what is it that Home Depot is doing in New York to help, you know, convert so many of those purchases to uh, so many of those visits. To purchase it, is it like you were saying before of CPC? Is it a personalization um, play? Is it um, are they doing better? At, you know, click uh, click and collect, right? Buy online and go and pick it up in store. Um, really helps you kind of focus your your investigations to figure out how you might be able to do better um, in in combating your key competitor in the space. Um, and then this, you know, we, we covered this in our last webinar part too a few weeks ago, but it's also important, like CPC mentioned, um, you know, just the, uh, the merchandising and the collection of, of products that people are, are, each of these retailers are having. Um, we showed here, even though Lowe's has a smaller visit count overall, when we looked at their product page visits to refrigerators, they had, um, they had more visits than Home Depot, so 5.7 million visits to refrigerator pages on Lowe's versus 5.2 million for Home Depot. Um, and if you think about that too, it's not just that they had half a million more visits, it's that they, that is a, that 5.7 is a much bigger share of their overall, um, uh, overall page views or, or, or visit share. And so these refrigerator products that may be more likely to kind of 
you view them online, but then you go to a store to pick them up from Home Depot's you know, standpoint, they might think, well, hey, we're really killing it versus Lowe's. But in fact, these other, these are types that they're doing much better in the types of, of products that they, they're driving people to stores to go and touch and feel and pick up as opposed to just ordering them online. So really giving an idea of how merchandising and the popularity of certain categories are performing on each of those sites and, and help to help to use that to provide background into how to interpret the, the purchase data. So the other thing that we looked at here, and this was really interesting, and it's something that we kind of get asked from our clients a lot, is that, you know, we can create audiences through our audience view platform, uh, which is pretty unique, and where we can take those those checkout points and use them to, in, in ways to build an audience. So in this instance, what I did is I went into the platform, and I said, well, tell me people who have uh, visited Lowe's.com, but have not made a purchase on Lowe's.com last week. and then Overlap that with people who've made a purchase on HomeDepot.com. So last week, Lowe's had 90,000 um, visitors who, these are unique individuals, not just visits, but 90,000 people who visited their site and then went to make a purchase on HomeDepot.com instead. Um, that's a lot of people that they lost uh, to Home Depot. And, you know, we said that that's, you know, $150 transaction on average. Uh, online, that's about 13 to 14 million dollars that Lowe's uh, lost to Home Depot last week. Um, if you you can flip it around too, and we can create that same audience for Home Depot. Tell me people who have visited HomeDepot.com but who have not made a purchase, and then went on to make a purchase on Lowe's instead. So from Home Home Depot lost about 55,000 uh, people who went ahead and made a purchase on Lowe's instead of Home Depot last week. So that that amount is not you know. Home Depot would like to get that number down as low as possible, but it's not, uh, they're still coming out about 45,000, 40, 40,000 uh, visitors ahead who made a purchase on Home Depot as opposed to Lowe's and trying to figure out, you know, why did I lose those 55,000 people? What did those, where else did those people spend time searching online? What, what products were they viewing? Uh, what were they searching for? Maybe it's things that I don't carry currently, and I can I can start to merchandise those things. Are they looking for sales? Are they looking for something um, a elf unique that I just don't deliver on that Lowe's does a better job? And that can help you really to kind of improve your overall purchase uh, purchase numbers. So sticking with retail, we also went ahead and looked at kind of more than just making a purchase on a page because there's a, n a number of our clients are also asking us to help them understand the conversion funnel. Um, and what we did is kind of looked at Stitch Fix here because we have, um, you know, Stitch Fix is something where you sign up, but it's a multi-step process in signing up. So you'll visit Stitch Fix and you might click here to say, get started. Um, and once you do that, the URL updates and it says you're basically starting to fill out your style profile. And then you connected your Facebook account to it and you, you know, provided some more personal information. And as you move along the funnel, Hitwise can identify those key milestones tie, and tie them to URL patterns that we can then separate out to show exactly how people are progressing through the conversion funnel for whether it's Stitch Fix or for a loan site or for a travel booking company. Um, it pretty much applies across the board, uh, but this is just an example of what we've done for one site here, again, in the retail space. Um, and then it allows you to kind of trend that data um, month to month, week to week to show how many people did Stitch Fix have that basically these are new signups in the month of June. We saw a big bump in the month of July and then dropped down in August and September. Um, what percentage of those people then went on to actually make what Stitch Fix calls as a reservation, which says, you know, I've decided that I want my box every month or every other month or every quarter. We can see that that fairly closely follows the total numbers of signups, but we can also do some simple math and say what percentage um, did they lose from, from sign up to reservation? So what's the drop off rate as each step moving for, moves forward through the funnel? Interestingly, as their, as their purchase, as their signups and reservations kind of were on the decline, their schedules, meaning schedules people said like, ship me a box, here's my credit card information, I would like an order to be delivered next month. Um, that has actually moved up and it's doing even better. So this will show you that if you're just looking at the overall the, the stitch fix, there's at least three levels of information that you're not seeing that can provide you um, a lot of competitive information if you're looking at stitch fix as a competitor. 
But if you're also stitch fixed, you can create audiences in the same way that we did um, in the previous slide with Home Depot and Lowe's and figure out what is it about these people who signed up but didn't, you didn't book a reservation? Or what is it about these people who checked and clicked a reservation but didn't go all the way through to providing their, their credit card information and scheduling a box to be shipped? And how can I actually target more of those people who actually made a purchase as opposed to people who signed up and didn't, um, and, and didn't go on and, 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 and make a purchase with me? And we can also apply that to a completely different category, still looking at kind of the conversion funnel, but looking at, you know, three different sites um, who are more or less doing the same thing. We looked here at the financial category, and these are um, where we've taken a look at total visits to each of these sites and compared it to the total number of people who had started a loan application. So just really taking simple math. How many people did we see visiting the loan application start page? divided by the total number of visits to the site. So we can see like Dream and Prosper, pretty much the same, about 17 and 18% of visits ultimately went on to, to start a loan application. Marcus had a much lower conversion rate from, from visits to start, and that might be a conscious decision, right? They're, they're specifically trying to weed out people who um, they, don't, uh, they don't want to um, really uh, do business with or that aren't prime candidates for things that they're offering. Um, Going a step farther, we can say, you know, what's the conversion rate for people who started an application on my on each of these three sites to the percentage of people who finished? And in this case, we see Marcus and Lightstream had fairly similar numbers, 42 and 36 percent of people who started their applications um, ended up completing it, whereas Prosper had a much higher, basically three and four people who started an application on Prosper went on to complete it. So that'll give you an idea, you know, Prosper, I think, has a very simple form. It's basically one page and you click submit. Um, is If you're just judging your success by your overall completion rates relative to how you performed in the past, you're really missing a bigger part of the picture. How much better could you be doing if you looked at employing some type of techniques like your competitors are doing? If Marcus would start to do a one page form like Prosper, could they go up to 74% or are they happy at 36%? Yeah, John, that's that's a unique question there. I mean, obviously, Prosper is a different type of company than Marcus. I think Prosper is more of a peer-to-peer -peer lending company. But if if I look at this data and I'm you know part of a of, of one of these companies, I think from a user experience standpoint, I mean, form fill is all about user experience. Where it, there's the flow design, like how many pages or steps are involved. Is it all above the fold? Is it below the fold? Um, obviously, the information you're asking for. It may be you know if somebody's asking for a sensitive piece of information that's just instantly going to, you know, move your complete rate down. And then lastly, I, I'd have to imagine a lot of the information being asked is going to be somewhat sensitive. What is the messaging to help consumers be comfortable with what they might be putting in the box? You know, are you talking about, you know, the, the confidentiality and security around that and whatnot? So I think user experience teams are always should be looking at, you know, competitive um, competitors and how they're, fill rates and flow rates work. Um, there's a lot of A-B testing that can be done and is for sure often being done in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this just gives you an idea of even before you do your A-B testing, you know, what's the, what is the other industry? What are my direct competitors? How are they doing who are employing things that I might be wanting to A-B test in the future on my site specifically? So it gives them a little bit more of an informed decision. Um, you're moving into like the CPG space, so we also can track, you know, online purchases of groceries specifically. In this instance, we're looking at people who made a purchase on Kroger.com um, and helping us better understanding who they are and how to reach them, kind of creating like a white list of media sites that you might want to um, go after and, and either create partnerships or working on display advertisements. So we looked at a subset of media sites. Where, where are Kroger.com buyers really found in higher than average concentrations? And we can just pick three sites here that you see on your screen. So good housekeeping, um, one in seven people who visited uh, Kroger, who made a purchase rather on Kroger.com we're visiting Good Housekeeping, which is uh, about 2.5 times higher than average. Um, the stir on Cafe Mom, the blog there, um, had one in 12, only one in 12 people visiting it, but that was a rate of 3.7 times above average. And then if you look at Pioneer Woman, right, you've got only one in 19 people 
Kroger buyers uh, visiting that site, but that index is about 4.5 times higher than average. So, you know, understanding, you know, hey, you go to Pioneer Woman, you actually are getting a really targeted audience there, um, but because their visit counts are so low, you're not actually going to be paying you know, the premium to reach a lot of people who you know actually are, you're not actually interested in, in reaching. Another site that showed up here was interesting. It's not necessarily one that you can advertise on um, like you can on some of these other media sites, but Fab Fit Fun uh, presented another piece of information about them. You can actually, you can partner with Fab Fit Fun to potentially include products or um, messaging within their subscription box, but it also tells Kroger, right, that my buyers are actually part of this, um, part of the consumers driving the subscription box industry, which we've talked about a lot in the past. Um, but that might not help them to inform, like, how can I actually capitalize on this? Can I maybe join into the type of Blue Apron types of purchases where I can create meal kits for my customers because I know that they're already interested in this type of of uh, offering from, from a completely separate um, industry. Yeah, John, no, I think that this makes a lot of sense. If, if, if the goal of Kroger is, and again, a lot, the vast, vast majority of what is purchased from Kroger is purchased in store, but if part of their goal is to really identify and drive more online buyers and, and tap into that kind of younger, um, you know, more kind of internet for clientele, um, understanding the buyers and where they should be reaching them is is super important. You know, I think of think of the programmatic media teams. You know, whether they're targeting these people on Open RTB or they're setting up you know PMP deals in order to um, in order to engage your consumers. Uh, I could see you know a lot of folks may set up a PMP of say 10 to 20 sites and split budget evenly. Well, if you're able to look at your buyers relative to your private marketplace purchases, might you allocate your budget differently? Might you drop some sites that were very poorly indexing? Might you add in some new sites that weren't necessarily maybe the highest volume, but their likelihood of your buyers being there is super high? So again, just just the simple act of indexing some of your core target media um, endpoints against your buyer set may change your um, may change some of your planning or budget allocation or or site list for where you want to engage those consumers. Right. So we're going to um, kind of head into the last part of the webinar, which is looking at some uh, some buyer behaviors um, on on uh, travel sites. And in this case, we're going to be looking at people who made a booking on Expedia.com, um, but then taking that piece of information and applying again some of the other Hitwise um, metrics to it to see um, when you have a a, a buyer. Uh, confirmation page set up. You can also see what sites preceded their visit to uh, to Expedia when they made a booking or what searches they were um, conducting on Google or other search engines that resulted in a visit to Expedia that then led to that, that booking uh, down the line. So really helping to inform like, again, what are the best drivers that, that resulted in a, in a visit, in a, in a booking, not just a visit to the site. And here you can see, this is a little bit of an eyesore here, but you can see a lot of very detailed searches that resulted in a visit to Expedia. And then uh, we can also look at the percentage of each of those search queries that resulted in a hotel booking. Um, so you can see here the hotel, the searches right uh, highlighted in yellow there, they represent kind of the, the variations with near me in it. And you can see in general, Variation that uh, had near me in it converted about 50% uh, better than uh, better than average uh, for Expedia and resulting in a hotel booking. We also see a lot the ones in green have either you know a hotel I'm mean, sorry a, a city a state um, an airport code uh, some type of geographic reference in the search itself um, and overall when we looked at those those uh, those types of uh, of searches which contain that geographic element generally converted at about 30 percent so of course there's a lot of different um, geographic um, variations that can be included in your you know in your in your bidding and your list but it's a, it's a very long tail right but they they generally pay off very well um, so I think CPC had some thoughts about like how you could employ some of that in terms of your bidding strategies um, which I thought were really interesting 
Yeah, I mean, from a, I, I spent quite a bit of time running running SEM in, in e-commerce, and obviously the t- tail keywords are sometimes where the best conversion is, but they're the hardest to add group, they're the hardest to bid appropriately, and also they're in some cases the hardest to create the, the right SEO content for. And so if you're able to identify not necessarily the individual keywords, but like the, the trends that are in them, like, you know, if having this, the city and or the state or the, the state abbreviation, if those are always driving notably higher conversion rates, maybe there's a, a, a large keyword generation effort that, you know, m- seeks to make sure all your, your, your coverage in the tail is there. Or if those words are really hard to get volume on, so it's tough to bid them, maybe they need to be grouped into ad groups and maybe bid the ad group bid at that level versus the individual level where it's, I think, more difficult to, you know, to, to always to, to get the right amount of traffic to make bid adjustments. And then finally, um, creative obviously matters a lot in the search world. And so to the extent that maybe there's some messaging around these near me terms or these geography based terms that just from the, the description that you could offer or any other elements of the creative would allow you to draw, you know, higher click through rates and, and more efficient cost per clicks to, um, to these types of words, which again, aren't the, the largest volume ones, but for sure driving, you know, notable conversion. Right. We're going to stick with travel here for the next uh, the next slide. But you're looking at people who um, this is where a, a point that we've set up for people who have actually booked a hotel on Hilton.com. So made it all the way through the booking process and clicked like you know uh, secure my, my my hotel booking on Hilton.com. And if we wanted to look at you know what else again similar to what we were looking at before for the Kroger example with media sites, but taking a, an approach here is like you know what types of partners sites. Would uh, partner companies would I would would make the most sense for Hilton to work with if I were Hilton, knowing people who are booking on my site, you know, airlines are a great you know a great idea for 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 partnership opportunities with a hotel brand. So could um, rental car companies or OTAs or you, know, you name it. There's a lot of different opportunities, but here we looked at like the cross visits from uh, to top airline sites. Uh, against people who uh, who booked on Hilton.com, and we can see that the you know kind of the the big three airlines here, Delta, American, United, they were all much more likely uh, to be visited by Hilton.com bookers, and at, on average, in fact, you know even the 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 discount carriers had very high indices as well. But you can see a clear difference between the top three and the discount carriers um, between their likelihood to to visit Hilton dot or book on Hilton dot com. So for Hilton you would probably want to pick um, one of the the uh, main carriers as as a partner opportunity. And Delta in this instance came out on top with a their Hilton.com bookers being 9.7 times more likely to visit Delta.com than average. Um, so really kind of telling you, hey, this is your best um, partnership opportunity, I think, here. Um, if we were looking at a discount carrier, JetBlue would probably come out just ahead just by a, a, a smidge there with uh, their visitors being about 7.8 times more likely to uh, to, to visit JetBlue. Um, and then you can also look, this is a question that we get asked over and over again, not just by clients in the hotel space, but any kind of client who uses, uh, who works with affiliate partnerships, whether it's in the travel space like we're looking at here or whether we're looking at financial or another category. Um, everyone wants to get as much of that booking activity or application activity uh, performed on their site directly. Uh, in this instance, we're taking just Hilton.com visitors but taking the the buyers rather and looking at the buyers on booking.com, Expedia.com, Hotwire, and Travelocity. So these are people here, 2.27% of of, of uh, Hilton.com visitors ended up booking a hotel on booking.com. It could have been a completely different hotel, and we actually do have ways in a lot of instances of identifying the specific hotel that they were booking as well. Um, but we know that they booked a hotel on booking.com and and not on on Hilton.com. You can also see, you know, 1.93% of them visited, made a hotel booking on Expedia. So for Hilton to understand, here are kind of my frenemy sites. I know that I had an overlap. Somebody visited my site and then booked a hotel on an OTA. How could I convert more of those people who visited my site to actually book directly with me as opposed to me having to shell out the money to the OTAs for completing that booking when they're already uh, spending time on my site? 
then we can also understand competitive threats. So here is an instance where we're taking a look at the people percentage of Hilton.com visitors who booked on some of the top vacation rental sites. And we can see one point, almost 1.5% made a booking on Airbnb and another 0.4% booked on VRBO. So that's about 2% almost of Hilton.com visitors who, um, who booked a, a vacation rental, not even a hotel, not even through an OTA, um, but through the vacation rental space. So identifying what percentage of business am I probably losing to this um, established and even and, and continuing to grow sector of, of the lodging industry. Um, so a good thing to keep an eye on here. Um, so yeah, I think that this is the last example slide, but then I think CPC is going to take us through some quick high-level takeaways, and then we'll have maybe see if we have some time for questions. And if you haven't submitted any questions yet, feel free to do so in the comments uh, bar of GoToWebinar here. Now, John, thank you so much. Those, those are all fantastic examples across a, a wide set of industries. Um, I'm not going to you know read through all of these, but in essence, you know some of the high-level takeaways. A lot of it is around user experience. The fact that you can understand, you know, buyers versus browsers, and in particular, what the fact that that is able to, to produce a conversion rate number. Knowing that conversion rate or that funnel rate is something that I think user experience, site designs, and, and messaging teams really should be looking at it low hanging fruit to examine. In particular, across desktop versus mobile, where I know the the experiences that you have to design are obviously notably different. Um, getting back to that Lowe's and, and Home Depot example. So many areas of the country, you know, are, are are driven by you know different types of consumers and and different types of needs through various seasons. So like understanding that conversion rate by and purchasers based on geography and even category. Again, another layer of data that if if as retailers or other areas you're not thinking about it that way or don't have access to that data, I think there are often actionable elements that can come out of of seeing that that geo view or that category based view of conversion. I um, mean. Yeah. For, for clients out there that spend a notable amount of money in, in media dollars in digital, obviously knowing the sites where your buyers are most likely to be, you know, not every campaign is looking to drive consumers uh, that to seek online purchase. You know, some are just brand oriented, some are co-branded, some are looking to drive consumers into the store um, for purchase. But if the goal is to try to find more online buyers, knowing the types of sites they spend time on is, is super key. And maybe to wrap up here, um, I think, SEO and SEM are always going to be tried and true to the extent that you can back into keyword learnings for SEM and SEO, knowing the conversion trends by, by keyword types and even a trends within keyword sets. Um, I, I think there's some, some strategy and some kind of implementation work in, in the search world. And then finally, John, I think both with Lowe's and Home Depot and then that last example with Hilton, to know where you're losing a visitor, uh, of losing a visitor to a purchase on a competitor you know, there's probably 10 different reasons why that's happening and it'll vary by industry, but just even understanding where is it happening? Is it happening more often? Am I getting better at it? The ability to trend those kind of metrics, I think is a, a real another interesting set of health metrics for, you know, for, for executives and department heads and, and specific teams who, who can impact that. And so those are some of the high level takeaways. Uh, the last slide that we'll just leave it on, I'm not going to go through this is, some of the more the uh, just the specific examples we went through. I'll turn it back to Lisa to uh, to wrap us up. Perfect. Thank you, John. Thank you, CPC, um, and thank you everyone for joining us today for the presentation.